Are you a CrossFit coach or maybe a box owner looking to learn more about nutrition? You want to help support the athletes that come to your box, maybe you have some one-on-one -on -one clients. And we all know nutrition is the foundation. We all talk about the theoretical hierarchy of the development of an athlete. And nutrition is at the base. It's like building a house. You can't build the attic first. You can't worry about performance and sport without working on the foundation. And that's what nutrition is. So maybe you're a coach, maybe you're a box owner, maybe you're just an athlete looking to potentially earn a little more income, develop a new income stream as a nutrition coach. Well, you could check out the Own Your Eating Certificate course. We review fundamental nutrition principles, as well as teaching you how to implement flexible eating, that's macro counting, and assist others with their tracking of macros. The cool thing about it is you're going to learn so much for yourself. Even if you didn't want to coach anyone else, but you simply wanted to learn more about tracking macros, you will get so much out of this course. It'll be the last thing you ever have to read, study, purchase, because you're going to get so much information. As well as sharing nutrition experience with you, Own Your Eating will also teach you how to coach others so that you can really make a difference with the people in your community and your lives. Maybe you need to finally get your mom to track macros. Maybe it's your best friend. Maybe you, you put on the quarantine 15 and you're looking to just lose a few LBs, a few pounds yourself. This will teach you all of that. And the cool thing about macros, the cool thing about the way in which we at Own Your Eating teach you is it's really sustainable. The business setup and marketing strategies are also included. So if you do really want to make this a side deal or a side hustle, You'll, you'll have all the tools you'll ever need to do. And in addition to that, if you're a level three CrossFit coach, you can earn CEUs to help you revalidate. And we also give CEUs for NASM as well as AFA. So you can check that out. For me, every few years, I need to re-up my L4, you know, no big deal, L4 coach, but this will help you do it. So if you're interested in learning more about the Own Your Eating Certificate course, you can go to courses.ownyoureating.com. Or if you just go to ownyoureating.com, right up in the header there, it says become a coach. You can click on that. And with the code BEST HOUR, that's B E S T H O U R, BEST HOUR, you'll get 15% off. Go check it out now. I was the one, along with Roz, who helped put this all together. So, I really understand that if you have questions for me about it, of course you can reach out, but I really believe in it. I've put hundreds of people through this course. It's the way I learned how to track macros. It's the way I've been tracking macros for over five years, and I think you will absolutely love it. So go check it out again, courses.ownyoureating.com, and use that code BESTHOUR for 15% off. All right, Jay, we're talking about chapter 12, the freeze game. So right off the bat, Jay, stop. What are you thinking? I'm thinking I'm excited to talk about the freeze game. What are you feeling? I'm feeling excited. I'm, I'm feeling a little nervous is, you know, the, the fun part for this interview with me every time is I try not to do too much reading and research of what we've talked about because I like the surprise of it. I like having to dig deep and think about what's going on. So there's a bit of an excitement in the air of like, okay, what am I going to say about this? The anticipation. So you're, you're thinking about doing this interview and you're excited about it. And of course, last question is, what are you doing? <laughs> you're doing I'm doing this interview. So those are the three questions of the freeze game. We just did it right now. That was it. What are you thinking? What are you feeling? What are you doing? And it's that simple. It's that yeah. simple in the sense that you don't have to over overthink it, over complicate it, compl complicate it. Just nail those questions. And it may seem overly simple or, or a little redundant as one question bleeds into the next. You know, but what? Tell me more about this freeze game and these three questions. Where did you find this game? What's the origin? So once again, it came from my mentor Sasha. It came from Sasha in that, you know, there were. It was, it was Sasha, and then it was also, there was a therapist that was also preaching the same thing. So it was like coincided right at the same time. And I think the therapist kind of dubbed it something a tiny bit different, but Sasha's like the freeze game. You know, you gotta, this is what it is. What are you thinking? What are you feeling? What are you doing? 
And it was at a time where I was just highly stressed, busy with the business, letting everything impact me. And it was like, dude, you need to relax. You need to chill out. And that's what this allows you to do. So Sasha teaches you the freeze game and so does the therapist, which maybe in a way that's the universe teaching you the freeze game with, uh, with it coming from all these sources. Uh, and then they instructed you or one of them instructed you to set alarm uh, every three hours or every couple hours, 7 a.m., 9 a.m., noon, 3 p.m., 7 p.m., so five times a day. Uh, how long did you do that for and what was the rationale behind that? So that, that, that was Sasha's doing and that the rationale is just, all right, you know, maybe I didn't have to be so precise and dive into it as, as deeply as I did there, but it's all right, you need to really set times aside. And if you don't set your alarm, you, you won't do it. And the alarm is really impactful because no matter what you're doing, you'll, you'll hear it, right? You have your phone on you and then it's just, it'll say freeze game. You know, you can change the label of your alarm and then you just answer those questions. Sometimes it's, writing it down in your notes. Sometimes it's simply just thinking about it in your head. But the, not, the bigger picture is it forces you to take that break. Not, not that you would set an alarm during this time, but I can just imagine an alarm going off like mid Fran. What are you thinking? What are you feeling? What are you doing? <laughs> and and yet, you know, for that reason, you have to be a little strategic on when you place those alarms, right? So those were probably times I wasn't coaching. I wasn't working out. Or, or if you do, of course, you miss it. Not a big deal. You know, if your phone's not on you. But yeah, ideally, you know, set it for a time. Hey, I'm, I'm at the house just, you know, relaxing. Or, you know, I'm at the office, but not during, not during frame. Now, there's a specific story in the book that we can certainly talk about a little bit more. But when you were in that meeting with Sasha, was there a, a catalyst? Well, like, what, what was he, what were you guys talking about, if you can remember? Or what was your state of, of mind and mood? where Sasha just looked at you and he's like, Jay, you need to do this right now. You know, I think this was a period of time where the business had grown exponentially. Uh, you know, we had a second affiliate, we had multiple coaches and I would just found myself, you know, as we've talked about in other chapters, not taking care of myself and just running yourself ragged. You were there, you were part of it where there were days we'd come in at, you know, seven, eight, nine in the morning and, and leave at seven, eight, nine at night and just feel like you didn't have one second to yourself. It's funny how that's a reoccurring theme of, you know, you're in fitness, you're coaching, you have a, an affiliate and you continually have moments where you're not pay, paying attention to your own needs. It's just, it, it's a reoccurring thing, but I think that's something that many entrepreneurs can relate to. Yeah, I don't think it's unique to me. I think whether you're an entrepreneur or, you know, you, you work a nine to five and you have a family, sometimes you just forget to take care of yourself it, or you feel selfish taking care of yourself. I've had plenty of box owners tell me, you know, they, they feel guilty taking a paycheck and, you know, this is your job. This is what you're doing and you're working really hard at it. You should feel not only like you're deserve a, a paycheck but like you earned it and it's yours yeah and if you're working 80 hours a week you know you certainly earned it you know and and with all that being said i'm sure we could have been more productive i think there are definitely times at the gym where we were busy not necessarily productive and we'll talk about that and you know some of the decisions we made to fix that but yeah this was just that period of time that was high stress um you know the more coaches you bring on you might be coaching less but you're dealing with human drama you're dealing with members that like this coach that don't like that coach. We were dealing with members that wanted to do their own programming members, you know, that would complain about everything. And I think if you're a box owner, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I think, uh, I think this was around that time where we had the little walkie talkie apps on our phones. I can't remember what the name of it was. Yeah, um, we had, I think we had Voxer. Yeah. All right. That's what it was. Voxer. <laughs> You know, because some of us would be in Clifton Park, some of us would be at ACF, some of us would be out and about running errands, you know, and so we'd be able to vox in. And I think we also around that time got a uh, an app called Wonderlist, where, which was yes. a, a blessing and a curse. So uh, I still have Wonderlist. I still use it, but it's a private account. No one else can, can give me task. But it's an app where you can make lists and if it's a, a group, you know, account, you can give each other task. 
So on Wonderlist, everyone had their own file. There was James, Caleb, Dean, Caleb, or Murph, uh, Kevin, and you had the ability to go in there and just add little notes and add little tasks, do this, do that. And it was micromanaging to the extreme. It got yeah. out of control to the point where no one had Wonderlist like a couple months later. We just got rid of it. I think you're explaining exactly why I needed the freeze game, James. Yes. So, yeah, you know, that, that was, hey, that was a big lesson to me in, in, in business ownership of not micromanaging. You know, and I think if you're a box owner, if you're a small business owner, it's a hard balance because you want to give your employees freedom, but then when they don't meet expectations, and not that you guys didn't, but, you know, whether it's expectations or deadlines or just being proactive, you're like, well, now I have to micromanage, which wasn't necessarily the best answer. Yeah, it's it, it turned into, you know, let, let's say someone didn't meet their deadline and didn't do something. And then all of a sudden, it was like the punishment to the entire group. You would give a task. Maybe it might be you, you would put in my thing, hey, write, write the workout on the board tonight before you leave for the morning class for Brett. And then five minutes later, you're getting a text. Hey, did you write the workout on the board? No, it's 5 p.m. Why are you asking me if I did it already? You know, like trust that I'm going to do it later. And, and some of us, you know, like it's uh, our eyes twitched a little bit getting those frequent texts. It's like, no, I'm, I'm working on it. Like, you know, I have to coach. You know, I have to, to do this and do that. Other things that were asked for. Yeah. And just remember, as crazy as, as I was making you guys, I was making myself. Yeah. So as, it was a you know, trickle think, down of crazy. <laughs> it was just a, yeah, it was, you know, it's, it's the same we would say about the culture of your box. Like the, the, the box owner, the, the manager, whoever's in charge can really impact how everyone else is feeling and how excited they are about being there. If you're, if you're dumping to do lists on them all day, they're not going to enjoy their job very much. No. And that's why we got rid of Wonderlist, or at least most of us. I know uh, there's a group a, account. There was a period of time where we just, I should say, just tried to hop on any of the next uh, technology, the next app that we can use. I'm like, okay, now we can use this, right? So there's a new walkie talkie out. Everybody needs to download it. This is what we're using now. And then it was like, that is a Wonderlist. And I know there was always a learning curve for everybody. And, yeah, I remember used to yelling at people, hey, we got an email. Why didn't anybody respond? It's been five minutes. Yeah, so. and then it's like, it's all right, an email comes in. Who's supposed to respond? Is it the first person that sees it? Is it, you know, if it's a particular question, if it's about membership, James responds to it. If it's about an event, Caleb responds to it. You know, uh, uh, having systems and procedures for that helped a lot. Yeah, we definitely got to that point versus the whole, you know, well, somebody else will do it type mentality. Yeah, which is, if you have five people on an email account, like the info at Albany CrossFit, everyone's, it's, it turns into a waiting game. Okay, well, I can't do it right now. Someone else will respond to it. And then no one responds to it. Yeah, there's that theory in psychology. I forget what it was, but someone was being attacked on the street. And, you know, many people heard this attack happening. And everybody, you know, was like, oh, somebody else will call 911. Yeah. And it was kind of the same analogy, like, oh, there's seven people in this inbox. Somebody else will respond to this email. Yeah. But we learned. We learned, we learned and we grew over time. Now, slow, slow and steady. <laughs> now, the specific story in the text here, uh, when we're talking about the freeze game, involves you watching an on-ramp, and there's a new coach, and they're teaching the push jerk. And no one was getting hip extension while they're teaching the push jerk. And this is maybe a, uh, an example of, as well of a simple complex simple, you know, it's simple for you, but not for the new coach to see lack of hip, hip extension and actually correct it. Uh, and essentially what happened is you, you uh, lost your mind, quote unquote, <laughs> from the text, and you went into the group and you took it over and you just started to teach the push jerk, just like a, a bull in a china shop. You just plowed right in demanding that everyone open their hips. And no one knew what was going on. The coach was upset. The members were like, who's this guy? Because they're all brand new. First, who was the coach? And then second, can you dive a little more into that and how it all went down? All right. Well, I don't think I used the name in the book, did I? No, no. Yeah, I, I purposely didn't. Do, so do you want me to say the name? 
Well, I, is this someone I, I, I'm trying to think of who it was teaching on ramp? At, at All time. right, I'll, I'll say the name, but also understand I'm going to say this name, and they're a good person. There's someone they've moved away, but there's someone I still stay in contact to to this day. And I also want to say, as we move forward, this was not on this person, it was on me because I didn't do a good enough job coaching this coach, but it was Clark. Oh, okay, yeah, so he was he would have been and he would have been an intern. Correct. In on ramp as well. So he was probably just getting a shot to teach. You know, yeah, it's like, I mean, hey, do you want to teach the push jerk today? Are you prepared? And maybe Kevin or someone else who was overseeing the class, or maybe even you, was uh, was given that shot. Yeah, I wasn't overseeing because, like I said, I remember for those that want to kind of understand the layout, there was this upper level hallway, and you can look into the courts. So I would stick around and kind of watch from above because. I can watch the on-ramp in one room and I can watch class going on in the other room. So I remember watching from up top, but yeah, you're right. You know, so Clark is a great dude. He, and he was an intern at the time and, you know, they're going through the push jerk and from up top, I'm just like, what is happening? Why is no one opening their hip? And like you said, as a perfect way to, to phrase it, like a bull in a China shop, I just ran down stairs and took over i can just imagine the scene here's this guy with long flowy hair and a beard that no one's seen before comes barging in the class there's several pugs following him and he's just yelling squeeze your butt open your hips well and, and you know you you said it really well and i hadn't even thought about it this way just because you're the owner or just because you're a level four coach these people don't care they probably like our on-ramp kind of you know, was on an island, right? It was, I believe, 7 or 7.30 every night. This was when we were doing yep. the 12. So it was like, we called it a boot camp. There were 12 sessions, three times a week that came in, they did their own thing. And, you know, they may or may not have known me at this point. And, you know, so just because I know what I'm talking about doesn't mean they had any trust or, you know, belief in me. Yeah, they had no buy-in with you. They'd been bonding with Kevin, myself, Clark. Uh, I think uh, I think Jenny would have been interning around that time too, um, for Shay. So yeah. So uh, let's back up a little bit. We'll come back to this, this particular story. But let's talk about Clark. So Clark was a big success story at Albany CrossFit. He made a lot of progress. Let's let's give him some spot in the limelight here. All right. Yeah, Clark. You know, I don't know if I don't remember when he joined, but he's just one of those guys that was really fun. Like mellow you know he's like wasn't overbearing but he was very quickly just accepted as part of the group because he was such a nice guy uh big ohio state fan i believe he went to ohio state and every you know probably what three times a year he'd show up in his little red speedo because yep, he was a for swimmer the town show yep yeah so he, you know and he would you know do something funny with that but just a great dude and lost a tremendous amount of weight with us i mean i'm I can't, we can find it, but there's a, remember that before and after picture where he has like a hard hat on, I want to say. Yep. That, that was, um, I first saw that photo in May, 2011, when I came to do my internship and he had been a member just before that. So he was probably 2010, 2011, somewhere about when he joined and he quickly just bought on to paleo, paleo zone, went all in and he just lost a ton of weight. Like his before and after photo, I even remember I took a picture of his before and after photo for my report, SUNY Cortland, and included it in it because he was such a big success story. And I also showed that photo around at the YMCA when I would talk about, you know, the Bankton YMCA when I went back to work there, how CrossFit could be effective and what you could accomplish doing that in paleo. Yeah. And, you know, in addition to this weight loss, he became quite a good athlete. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Muscle ups, everything. Exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. Muscle ups. Um, you know, big lifts, but, but yeah, we'll have to find that picture and post it. And obviously I'll have to now tell Clark he's infamous and, and part of this book, but, but again, I fully accept all the blame on this. This was not Clark's fault. And this goes to many lessons I learned. Like it's rarely your employee or your coach's fault. If something is happening below your pay grade, it's you as a leader. And that's the one thing I've tried to really, you know, learn over the years and, and, and remember, cause it's not always easy. So it's after the incident, you came in, 
And I mean, like, did you stay, do you remember, did you stay for the rest of the on-ramp and kind of just continue teaching it? Did you hand it back over to Kevin or you just taught the push jerk and bounced? What was that like? And then what was the interaction between you and Clark like after? Because he was a little upset about it. He was very upset. Um, no, I probably handed it back off to Kevin. The, as you know, the the on-ramp, and we can, you know, first of all, James and I recorded a full podcast on on-ramps for the best hour of their day podcast. So that's out there way back, you know, like it's like one of the first five episodes. And, it, you know, so our on-ramp was really detail-oriented. I mean, every minute of every hour was dedicated to something because it was not only the movements, but theory, methodology, workouts in there. So I probably it was like a level one. It was like members would go through like almost a full level one over the course of a month. Oh, we had people leave the on ramp and in short order take their level one and realize we taught them, you know, just about everything they're learning. Oh yeah. So I probably tossed it back over to Kevin for whatever the you know next evolution of that day was. And then yeah, after Clark came up to me and we had a you know, a serious talk about it. So you're in a situation where you you see he's lacking, but you made a mistake on the way you approached, you know, correcting him, which I, I've heard stories, and I don't know if they're true, of like of classmen doing things like that at level ones. Um, you know, like someone's teaching the air squat breakout, and then he walked into the group and said, everything you just did was wrong or something like that. I, I've seen, I've not seen it firsthand. I've heard stories about it. And, you know, even to this day, and we'll talk about my intern you know, process to get onto staff, but yeah, you're, you're teaching and, and you got somebody watching and they might hop in. Now there's a correct way to hop in and there's an incorrect way to hop in. Now Glassman may have done the incorrect way, but he's also coach Glassman and can do whatever the hell he wants. I'm not at that level, even if it was my box. And even if it, even if I was at that level, that doesn't mean that's how you should approach it. Yeah. So what's, what's the right way to, to hop in? and take control and say, hey, we need to fix this right now. We can't let this go on. So if, if I were to do it again, Clark's teaching the on-ramp. There's 10 people, say. Uh, you know, I think the first thing you really want to assess is you, you've got this idea of safety, efficacy, and efficiency. So no one was going to die getting lack of hip extension in the push jerk, right? No. So it begs the question, is it even necessary for me to interrupt? Now, okay. No one's opening their hips. Is this going to be an issue in their performance down the road? Probably. So let's address it. And I would just, I would have gone down there and maybe, I, you know, I'm, I'm debating whether or not I even would have interrupted. If I did, I would have maybe just stayed on the outside of the circle and given some cues to, to show them what to do. Or again, ask Clark to, to take a step back and say, hey, do you mind if I hop in? It's, it's all just in how you approach it. You know, and that could have been, hey, guys. Clark's doing a great job, but I, I own this place and I really wanted to coach you for five minutes. So I hope you don't mind, but let's just review this push jerk, right? It doesn't have to be, you know, pandemonium and me running in and, and yelling and screaming. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking if I was working with an intern coach, uh, I might do like kind of like the, the drive by comment, you know, like, like you, you walk, you're passing through, maybe they're in transition from one piece to the next, just kind of whisper in their ear hey, we need more hip extension, or hey, focus on this a little bit. And then you fade into the shadows. Uh, and then if they still don't get it, then at the end, I would say, hey, everyone did a great job. Um, what do you guys think of Clark? This is his first time teaching the push jerk. Let's all give Clark a hand. Celebrate yeah. what he did and then say, I want to add one more piece that I think will be very important and beneficial for the group. And then have Clark demo the hip extension and say, okay, let's do another round on me. And let's really focus on this piece right here. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. Like, you know, it could have been at the end. Hey, guys, let's just do a quick review of what you guys learned today. Yeah. Um, and, and this really brings up something that's important when we talk about the demo. So a lot of times a coach will grab a, an athlete from their class or their intern and say, hey, demo this movement. Be aware of what that movement looks like, what that demo is going to do before you have them do it. Because this whole thing was started because Clark was demoing without hip extension. Yeah. And I know you and I butted heads a couple of times on this. I don't know if you remember, but when you would teach the air squat, you've got like a really great air squat. So you would squat, you know, toes forward, relatively narrow, complete vertical torso. 
And everyone would try to mimic that. And I'm like, James, you need to squat wider with your toes. Do you remember having that conversation? Um, I, I wouldn't say we butted heads on it. I think uh, that was just yeah, like maybe. Maybe, feed, maybe feedback you gave me. And I'm like, oh, I don't realize I'm doing it because that's just how I squat, you know. But so, the but, members, but, they'll, yeah, they'll do what you show. It. Yeah, I had to change it to what the average person would be doing or yeah. the, someone who doesn't air squat would be doing. Right, because they'll do what you'll show. And, and while it's great to show such a virtuous air squat, if your toes are forward now, everyone's going to try to do that. And in this scenario, if you're not opening your hips, no one's going to open their hips. Yeah. And, and I think too, it's like, if you're, a, if you're a head coach and you're working with an assistant and you have them demo, if they don't do it right, then say, okay, that was a good, that was good. But now what Clark could do better is he could open his hips and it may, you, then you, you coach Clark in front of the group. You use tactile cues, you know, hands on the shoulder, squeeze your butt, verbal cue you know, whatever you got to do and then get him doing it right and call attention to what Clark was doing incorrectly. And then yeah, and you can do that without better. Than you, Clark. You, you could do that without making him look bad as well. And, you know, every weekend demoing for the level ones and level twos, there's times where the lecturer, if I'm demonstrating the squat or the press or the deadlift series, they'll fix me on the box. Yeah. And, and, and we're not all perfect movers. Like that's okay. Yeah, you need that feedback because you can't see what you're doing, you know. And I know, and I know at our gym right now, you know, our assistants, they they know that I'm going to make you do more reps if it, you know, if it's not it's not right. You're going to be on the pull up bar again, and we're going to do more. So like, all right, they're really focusing. I got to do this the right way. And then if not, then we'll do it again for the benefit of everybody in the room. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's no rush. There's no rush, especially non ramp. Like you exactly. don't got to rush. Exactly, and then. You know, we want, this is the movement pattern they're going to learn. So we want them to be doing this properly going forward. So going forward, how did you put Clark on the right track? And was that you that took him under your wing? Or did you delegate that to Kevin since he's leading him in on-ramp? What, what happened with Clark's development? So Clark continued, you know, we got over our issue, which was primarily on me. I apologized for it. It was definitely the wrong thing to do. And, you know, again, explain to Clark what was going on. And I remember working with Clark specifically on his movement and, and demonstrating for on-ramps. But then, yes, I'm sure he went, you know, Kevin was really, and, and you as well, had, you know, spearheaded that on-ramp for, for most of the time. So I'm sure he went right back under you guys. And he, he wound up going from intern to coach and becoming one of our, you know, successful coaches at the box. And, and I think it's important to note, too, that this was at a time where we would have 25 to 30 person on ramps regularly for, for four weeks. So imagine being a new coach or an intern and you're thrown out there with 30 people who have PVC pipes and you have to teach them one of the more complex shoulder overhead movements. That's, that's tough. Yeah. I don't doubt that we didn't even tell him he was going to do this until it was time to do it. Yeah. It used to that's, be throw you to wolves. Yeah. That's just, I was going to say, that's just how we rolled. It would be like, Oh, you're interning lead this, lead the warm up. Oh, you're interning, coach, you know, coach this. That was kind of my methodology for, for developing people. And I don't think it's wrong, but maybe he wasn't quite prepared yet. Like, I don't know if that was his first time shadowing in on ramp or a second, but in the future, I think what we started to do also, and probably because of this is let the interns know, Hey, next class, you're going to teach this come prepared. Yeah. I, I know right now, I would still do a, a mix. Like if, if you Jay were interning an on-ramp and this is like your fourth on-ramp, then I would at least think that you would know the progression by now. If you watched me do it several times and if not, then it's okay. It's on me for not checking in on you and, and maybe driving you more to, to be studying and stuff, but also it's on you for not wanting it and not putting in your effort, you know, to like know these movements. So it kind of lets us both know where are we at right now? You've been interning for three or four on ramps, month long on ramps, and you don't know the progression for four steps on the push chair. Whose fault is this? And we need to fix this. Yeah. And I don't think we were hiding the fact that we did this. So you would see the other interns, you know, get thrown into it as well. So, you know, I think that kind of our vision of it was hey, we're putting every time you come in here, you never know what you might have to coach. So you better be prepared for the entire hour. Yeah. And you know, the schedule, you know, the movements that are coming up, you know, that next Monday 
when you go to intern and that's the only day you can intern, that's snatch day or that's med ball clean day or whatever it's going to be. So be you ready. Review those movements. Exactly. Yeah. So exactly. I, I like I like the be ready at all times mentality because it's it's very much a CrossFit mentality, right? Like you, you have to be able to use your fitness on a drop, you know, out in the real world. You know, you're not going to warm up before you go to run away from the dog or the bear. So you have to be sharp with your skills and coaching too. Maybe you're stuck at the airport and a breakout session of air squat starts. So I was like, can someone please teach the air squat right now? And you can be ready to use it. That's right. The unknown and unknowable. Exactly. So a, um, a lesson you learned was don't come up with problems, have solutions. And yeah, I, I, mean, think, I think it's a great lesson. And I, 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 it's something that I encounter and I think many people encounter all the time where you have that one friend or that one person who's, they're always complaining and they're always listing problems, but they never have an idea of how to fix it or solutions. So I think this is a very good quote from, from the book. Um, did you come up with that with yourself or was that something that you learned from Sasha too? I, I think that kind of, I mean, Sasha had a huge impact on everything that I, I've done in this book, but I also think some of that was just lessons learned and talking to you guys where, you know, and, and Fern on the podcast refers to them as drunk monkeys. Like, don't just bring me a drunk monkey, you know, and, and that's his kind of analogy for a problem. Like, bring me a solution. And, you know, in, in this case, there were multiple solutions from working on myself to developing Clark to making sure they were slightly prepared before coming into the on-ramp class. But, but yeah, you know, that was something – Especially, you know, you, I mean, how many coaches do you think we had at one time, including interns? Like what was our heyday of staff? At least, at least 30. Yeah. I mean, so that's a lot of employees and it's a lot of employees that are only working one to two hours a week that don't have time to necessarily fix everything, but they would just come to you like 30 people coming to you with problems. And it's like, eventually it's like, stop giving me problems. What needs to happen? And, and you guys, the full-time staff were pretty good at that, but the part-timers, those that just interned and helped out, you know, that, that wasn't what they were great at. And it just, that's probably what led me to micromanaging because it was just so many issues coming at me on a daily basis. Yeah. I think there was anywhere from 12 to 15 interns at any given time. And then there were assistant coaches after that, maybe about five or six of those. Then we had the part-time coaches and then we had the full-time staff. So it was a giant staff. Um, And then, you know, there's also the cleaning staff. So there's many people who could be contacting you like, Hey, the floor cleaner is broken again, you know, exactly. Or or the floor is not getting cleaned. And then you find out months later, Oh, it's because floor cleaner is broken. We've been doing it by hand and no one told you, you know, this is all these things that can add up really quickly. Yeah, I mean, and you know, like like they, you know, talk about the, the the more employees, the bigger you grow, the bigger the growing pains, and that's what we were realizing. And I think this was probably kind of that apex, if you will, of all of that happening, where I lost. Like you know, you see it like in a movie. It's like the person finally loses their mind, the straw that breaks the camel's back. This was it, and and it's you know such a silly thing because I'm sure there was so much more going on and and more important things and more dangerous things but i lost it on hip extension hey i mean it, it just takes what that last straw it's like that movie falling down michael douglas yeah i'm gonna get out of my car leave it parked on the freeway and just yeah. start shooting people <laughs> because of <laughs> lack of hip extension <laughs> but, you know and and again it was like who knows what my day was like who knows what was going on it might have been right after having a tough conversation with one of the members but Unfortunately, Clark, you know, bore the brunt of that. So uh, are there any other examples that we can learn from of when you effectively use the freeze game? Like, like this could be af- after that, you know, it doesn't have to be uh, at, even at Albany CrossFit, but can you cite one instance where the freeze game helped you? I can't, I don't know that I can cite a specific instance. I use, I mean, it's something I still use regularly. I no longer have an alarm set, but as we're recording this, I'm thinking maybe we should, because the point is you don't only want to take that deep breath and that pause when you're stressed out. You want to take it throughout the day. So it's not like every time, like, what are you thinking? I'm really mad at this person. What are you feeling? Anger. What are you doing? 
I'm clenching my fists because I'm really mad. I'm like, joking, you man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking, Clark. Um, you know, so you want it to be like, what are you thinking? Oh, I'm thinking I'm having a, a great day. What are you feeling? I'm feeling joy and happiness. Like, what are you doing? You know, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking about my day. Like, it, it can be that simple. But what I'll do and what I did is just slowly take that pause and, and, and think about those things. And the more you do it, the more easy it is, the easier it is to do that when you're in a period of stress. So what, uh, is there a follow-up portion to the freeze game? So, cause re- the last question is, uh, what are you doing? So it, it, it starts off, you know, what are you thinking? I'm angry. What are you feeling? I'm, I'm really not liking this person right now. And then what are you doing? I'm choking them. Like is what's, what's the resolution for all of those things? Like what did Sasha explain? Well, the resolution, what do you, what do you use the information to do? In, in that moment, so let's use the Clark example. You know, what, what are you thinking? What are you feeling? What are you doing? What are you thinking? I'm thinking Clark's not doing a good job because these people aren't opening their hips. That's really what you're thinking, right? Yeah. There's no emotion. What are you feeling? I'm feeling anger. I'm feeling stressed. Like, are these people going to leave the gym because their coach is bad? You know, even though that's completely inaccurate. Yeah, they and don't then know what are you, bad. What are you doing? That would be like, I'm watching from above. But that would also be that mo- moment where you're like, what are you doing? All right, I'm going to, you stop. That's all you need. I mean, if you're listening or, or you like, or me, when you've gotten into an argument, a fight, you're angry, it's because you haven't taken that pause. So that pause just allows you to kind of reassess what you're about to do. So, so the initial stop and do the freeze game is the thing that stops you from walking into the room like a mad person and blurting out, you know, squeeze your butt, open your hips and taking control. Correct. And it could be as simple as, you know, take a deep breath. Like, and that's what it's become for me. Like, do I sit down and write down with that every time? No, but it becomes deep breath. What, what, what's, what do you, it's typically like, what emotion are you feeling right now? Anger. Cause you know, you're fighting with your significant other, you're fighting with a coach or you're, you're driving and someone cut you off. Right. Like rather than slamming on the horn, rather than going into road rage and following them, take that deep breath. Like, you know, and that's, you know, we're going to talk about in the future with you never know what someone's going through. And it's like, if I would have done that, I could have then really, you know, thought, okay, this is Clark's first time ever teaching this is, is he using the progression? Well, that's good. He, he studied, he knows what he's doing. Could he be better at getting hip extension? Sure. Could I teach him that? Yes. And, and then everyone has a better experience as well. The members, Clark, you, and I think as well, there's, there's collateral damage in this possibly, I don't know what, what was, what were Kevin's thoughts on this? Because it, it kind of reflects back on him. He's giving Clark the opportunity to teach the push jerk. So he's letting him go. Maybe he was going to give him feedback after, maybe he was going to jump in at the end and do what we said to do earlier. You know, like, Hey guys, Clark did a great job. Here's, what we well, I want one more thing I want to focus on. So was Kevin upset about it at all, or because that's almost like stepping on his toes as well? Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's kind of like the you know ongoing ramifications of your actions, right? You don't realize it's not just affecting Clark. It's not just affecting these twelve people. There's another intern in the class, like you said. Kevin's overseeing it, and and I'm pretty sure afterwards Kevin said something like to me to the extent of, "What the f was that?" Yeah. You know, that's how Kevin, that's how Kevin would have, you know, either, you know, I would have handled that or that was a piss poor way of handling it. Yeah, because now, you know, he's going to get the reins back and to finish out the on ramp. But there's this weird energy in the room and then you're gone, removed from it. Yeah. So he's got to pick up the pieces of class. Like you said, like a bull in a china shop, come in, knock everything down and leave. <laughs> exactly. So uh, any other thoughts on this chapter, Jay, or that time or the the freeze game no and i think you know really that time was very indicative of this where it's like you're trying to grow you're trying to take this thing to the next level you have a second box you know you have 30 coaches you can't hang on to every little detail of it also you know in in the in the list of priorities getting hip extension from those 10 people was very low you know there's probably far better ways that I could have been spending my time and working on the box. So just remembering that as you're going to grow, things are going to fall through the cracks. You know, that doesn't mean you would never address it, 
but that could have been okay i realize at this point there's a disconnect in some of our interns we need to have an intern development class or we need to work one on one with with some of these coaches but you know really taking solace and knowing hey if we're going to grow we we need to be able to step away a little bit and and still see that things are going to be improving and i would say probably the assignment for this chapter for the listener would be to implement the freeze game or maybe set some alarms what do you think yeah so i think what we should do for the challenge in this chapter is three three random times in your phone like obviously like we said not when you're going to work out so maybe a, a minute where you know in the morning after you've kind of gotten out of bed before you leave the house maybe around your lunch time and then maybe in the evening i i set my alarm you can label it freeze game and just remember the freeze game is what are you thinking? What are you feeling? What are you doing? I would say when you're first doing this, it'd be great to write it down or put it in the notes section of your phone or whatever app you use. But then as you get accustomed to it and as you do it, you know, maybe a week or two weeks later, just think about it and don't overthink each time. It's literally, what are you thinking right now? What are you feeling? What are you doing? And oftentimes the, what are you doing is, you know, writing down my answers or typing them into my phone or, if you're not doing that, you know, driving my car because I'm, you know, in the middle of a, of a road rage or whatever, whatever's going on, just answer the questions, but really take note in the fact that it caused you to take pause before reacting. And then I wanted to, I do want to throw in a second challenge here. This okay. goes out, especially to the coaches. If you're a CrossFit coach or a box owner, or even just a member, I want you to take the nine foundational movements so let, let me go through those real quick. Air squat, front squat, overhead squat. Press, push, press, push, jerk. Deadlift, sumo, deadlift, high pull, and medicine ball clean. Take those nine foundational movements, and I want you to grab some PVC and a medicine ball, and I want you to film yourself doing each movement. Do one rep facing the camera, one rep facing uh, 90 degrees from the camera, perpendicular to the camera, for each of those nine movements, and assess your movement. Just look at it, because you've probably not done that before. But to me, that was one of the best drills I ever did when I was on the staff getting ready to demo movements to see my faults and improve my movement and improve my mechanics. Yeah, and post it to your social media for feedback on just anyone looking. Hey, how can I get better? And uh, tag best hour of your day. Tag at Jason Ackerman or whatever your private account is and tag at James A. McDermott, all the tags. And it's uh, the kind of cool thing about it is you're trying to refine the skills of your movement and you're trying to refine the skills of your emotions and how you react to different situations. And uh, I think so either one of us is, is a skill to sharpen. Yeah. And with both of those, I think you're going to realize you have room to grow. Yeah. Tag us, send it to us, whatever you want. But I think if you do that and you're a box owner, you're a coach and you put it out there, your members will see it and they'll see that you're still trying to improve and you'll see where your faults are. Like, oh, wow. I don't open my hips or, oh, wow, my knees cave in, my elbows drop, whatever's going on. But yeah, I think for both the um, mental and physical, right? We're grown people on both levels today. And it's, you know, it's going to be pretty eye-opening. Yeah. And then maybe you teach it to your members, you know, what are you thinking? I'm thinking I really need to work on my double unders. What are you feeling? I feel a hatred for my jump rope and I want to throw it across the room. What are you doing? Trying to do double unders. You know. And I think that'd be great. I think all of these lessons, I hope that some people are taking them and passing them on to other people, whether they've read the book or not, if they're doing the challenges. But yeah, I think both of these will really be helpful. And I want to, before wrapping up, I just want to give a shout out to Clark because I you know, purposely didn't, some names I've changed in the book, full disclosure, because there were some you know, less than um, great stories, I should say. You know, I didn't want to make people feel bad. And I, didn't use, and I tried my best to reach out to people if I was going to use them, but Clark wasn't one of them, but he's someone I, I follow on social media. He's, you know, married now. He lives a, a great life. He's still doing CrossFit. Um, and uh, it's, it's fun to see his progression. And even at the time that he was at the box, he became a, a phenomenal athlete, phenomenal coach, but most importantly, someone, you know, towards the end of owning the boxes, I didn't like many people. And Clark was one of the people I still liked because he was just, he was very likable. He was a bright spot. Remember those bright spots? Yeah. We'll talk about that in another chapter. <laughs> it was probably put on your to-do list by me every day. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Jay. I think that wraps it up for chapter 12, Freeze Game.
Thanks again for listening to that special episode of Best Hour of Their Day. If you enjoyed, go ahead and download the book. You can check out the audio book. You can check out the paperback or even the ebook. We placed the link right in the show description. So once again, thanks for listening. Have a great rest of your day.